guys, today we're going to go ahead and talk about fashion ethics. Um, and there are a lot of issues surrounding fashion ethics, but today we're going to take a look at two of the more prominent ones. And of course, um, as I said, there's lots of issues that extend beyond this, but um, these two issues seem to be very pervasive across the globe and really have a lot of impact um, on not only people involved in the fashion industry, uh, but everyone around them. And in a way, everyone is involved in the fashion industry uh, because, of course, we all wear clothing. Um, so there's no hiding it, there's no escaping it. And um, it is going to be kind of a bummer, not going to lie. Um, but it's not meant to sort of deter you from the fashion industry, but just alert you to what is going on and some of the problems and the issues that are out there. So you as a young designer entering into the industry can be more aware of these situations and plan um, your own sort of career and where you want to work and what you want to do and, and, and how you want to make an impact uh, and just help you inform you on that and, and sort of give you a little bit of a, a guide again into some of those tricky areas within fashion. And we're going to focus on environmental concerns and also human rights concerns within the fashion industry. Um, so sometimes the fashion industry is not glamorous. Uh, we're used to sort of seeing this beautiful veneer of, you know, uh, beauty and glamour and style and all these wonderful things. But uh, behind that pretty face, we can sometimes find a lot of uh, really horrific things going on and like I said we're going to focus in on labor exploitation, uh, human rights issues, and also environmental damage uh, that is related to the fashion industry and like I said this is by no means the only two areas where fashion ethics arise. There's a lot of um, you know concern with diversity or you know portraying body image or being elitist or whatever else, but these are really, really widespread and um, really, really global, and uh, I think if you were to ask me what are the two major issues with the fashion industry today, I would, I would point to these two sort of aspects, and I have. <laughs> so let's start with garment workers, and this ties in with labor exploitation. So ethical concerns about how garments are sewn and textiles are made. So let's begin um, at the turn of the century in America. So um, a lot of these problems within the garment industry have effectively been somewhat mitigated in America itself. Um, but that is not has not always been the case. Um, America has had to go through a long sort of industrialization period in which these questions were asked, tested, um, and tragedies had to occur before implements were put into place to protect worker safety. Um, and I'd really like to point at a very historical event within the American garment uh, history, uh, and that is the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. That you may have heard of it, it is very, very famous. A lot of people uh, learn about it in history class. Um, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire happened on March 25th. 1911 in the Greenwich Village, Manhattan. The factory was a garment manufacturing facility producing women's blouses. The garment workers were mostly young girls. They were required to work long hours in a building with unsafe conditions. To ensure that they couldn't take breaks or leave early, doors, stairwells, and exits were routinely blocked off or locked. And a lot of these young girls were um, new immigrants at the time uh, and mostly of either Jewish or Italian uh, descent. Now, they again, under these very unsafe conditions, when they were essentially locked into their workspace so they could not leave and they could not be distracted or take breaks or anything like that, um, a fire broke out. Um, and this, again, uh, because of unsafe conditions, was spread very, very quickly. Um, you know, fire safety in general was a little less developed. Things were overcrowded. Um, as you can imagine, it was a clothing factory, so there was lots and lots of scrap cloth 
uh, which was very flammable pretty much everywhere. It was not properly cleaned, um, and there was the whole place was a huge um, fire hazard. Uh, so, of course, the fire uh, spread very quickly. Um, and many perished um, because they were not able to escape due to the fact that all of the exits were locked. Uh, all the stairwells were blocked off and the doors were locked. It was the deadliest industrial disaster in American history. Uh, I believe something like uh, 100, and, well, we have it, 154 were killed in the uh, uh, factory fire. Um, others, you know, leapt to their death trying to escape the fire. Um, it was, the de as I said, the deadliest industrial disaster in American history. Uh, the tragedy launched a new movement into workers' rights and subsequently uh, played a part in sort of spearheading the formation of labor unions and ultimately federal laws that were uh, put into place to protect the welfare of laborers. So um, this again started a movement the late industrial age um, where people saw these terrific, horrific conditions, so this is not safe, this is not good, we don't want this in our country. Um, so laws were passed, things like OSHA was formed, which regulates um, factory safety, uh, things like workers' rights and unions were created to protect, protect the worker, um, give them living wages, give them safe conditions to work in and things like that. So America has pretty much gone through this history and put into place all of these uh, different laws and practices um, to keep our work, uh, our work staff and our laborers and our garment constructors and, and, and uh, laborers in other industries uh, relatively safe. However, Today we have sort of moved out of America. A lot of manufacturing no longer takes place in America, and this is a result of globalization. With the advent of improved communication and transportation technology, the fashion industry has led the way in globalization. This means from farm to textile mill to garment factory to store, the steps of the garment production is spread out all over the world. And this is fine um, because we can utilize the skills from one area to the next um, with much greater speed and efficiency. However, it creates a bit of an issue uh, because this means that factory and labor oversight is no longer in the control of any one nation. And the uh, companies that produce clothing have the power to, uh, are the only ones that have the power to ensure the safety and well being of people involved. However, sometimes it is difficult to oversee and is often not a priority. So now that manufacturing and, and um, really just everything, so if you think of how many different steps along the line, you know, where that farm might be, the cotton farm uh, might be in India, the textile mill might be in um, uh, Korea, the garment factory might be in China, and then it might be sold um, in uh, London. Um, so you can sort of see, you know, throughout the process of creating garments, it really goes just across and around the world. So no one country really can be in charge of all of the labor standards, and it can differ from very varying country to varying country. And um, the issue is, again, uh, since there is no one sort of overseeing uh, uh, entity, over the whole supply chain, it's very hard to um, put in uh, different uh, rules and regulations uh, that will ensure worker safety. And we see this um, all the time. And again, it's not always just a function of, of sort of cruelty and profit, although sometimes it is. Uh, Sometimes it's just very difficult to know where your garments are being made. So a lot of, you know, say I want to use a garment factory and I go and visit the garment factory and it looks great and it looks fine and the workers are happy. Um, but that owner might also subcontract 
to other places that are not great and I've never even made aware of it as a sort of designer and um, you know client of the garment factory and that factory might subcontract someplace else and if you're just a you know a distributor or someone who owns a boutique or something like that you know um, who knows uh, uh, you go to a distributor uh, they got it from you know a factory um, that factory might have used subcontractors so a lot of it gets very difficult to trace back and of course you know the worst conditions uh, are often sort of hid over these layers of you know being subcontracted out and it, 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 they make it very very difficult um, to sort of trace everything back and ensure the sort of quality of the labor conditions and everything else that are in, uh, involved in your garments. Um, so even if you do have the best intentions, a lot of times it's very, very difficult to ensure the quality of every single factory that every single uh, piece of your product is coming from, especially when you're dealing with such a global chain because a lot of these places are across the world. So, you know, once a year you might go visit the factory. Um, because you can't really afford or, you know, you don't have the time to fly to China, you know, every other week to check up on, uh, you know, uh, the factory conditions and quality control and things like that. Um, and then, of course, a lot of it is a little bit more blatant. Uh, you know, uh, paying workers more, ensuring the quality of your workspace, giving uh, workers time off and benefits, it's all cost money. Uh, and that money eats into the overall profits. Uh, so a lot of times companies will indeed look toward uh, some of the more poor nations, the ones that specifically have not gone through the same industrialization process that America has in other um, countries. So they don't have the protections um, that a lot of more developed nations have. Uh, and they're, they're specifically direct their attention to those because in the absence of those regulations they can cut corners and again um, make more profit by cutting those corners. So I'd like to look at a few sort of more egregious um, aspects of uh, fashion industry worker abuse and um, in recent history, there's sort of one that stands out really, really clearly, um, and that's the Rana Plata Plaza factory collapse. On April 24th, 2013, a garment factory in Dhaka, Bangladesh collapsed due to structural fa failure. It killed 1,134 people and er injured another 2,500 others. It was the deadliest garment factory disaster in history. Prior to the collapse, cracks in the building's foundation were identified and deemed unsafe. However, the garment workers will st were still ordered back to come to work. And again, these would be conditions, again, much like the Triangle uh, Shirtwaist Factory, where garment workers would come in and pretty much the doors are locked uh, behind them until they get their quota done. Clothing. Uh, produced at the Rana Plaza uh, was created for many brands, including Benetton, Bon Marche, Prada, Gucci, Versace, Montclair, The Children's Place, El Corte Inglés, Joe Fresh, Mango, Madeleine, Primark, and Walmart. Although the Rana Plaza factory collapse is the worst disaster so far in Bangladesh's garment history, it is not an isolated incident. In 2012, a fire in the Tazreen Fashion Factory killed 112 garment workers. In fact, between 2006 and 2012, more than 500 garment workers died in factory fires in Bangladesh. So, um, what we have here is exactly what I was talking about before. Bangladesh is a nation sort of caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, what they're trying to do is develop a little bit too quickly and they are taking human rights out of the uh, equation in order to attract international clients to their garment factory. 
So what a lot of nations do is they can see that if they have a large sort of workforce force that doesn't really cost a lot because uh, their country is poor, um, they'll try to set up a garment industry. And that is exactly what Bangladesh has done. And um, on sort of the positive side, um, it does attract a lot of international clients, it builds up the economy, it provides jobs for a lot of people um, when the international design companies come and choose your garment factories. On the other hand, um, again, what they do to attract international clientele is they try to make it as cheap as possible. And in making it as cheap as possible, they um, obviously pay their workers as, as little as they possibly can get, get away with. Um, and in addition to that, they do not put the proper capital into ensuring the safety of their buildings, uh, their facilities, um, and things like that. So things like structural integrity, huge, major issues, um, you know, uh, where, you know, buildings like this, regardless of where it is in most developed countries, uh, would be condemned uh, right away and, and no one would be allowed in it. But again, Bangladesh has not had the time and the opportunity to go through the industrial rev their own industrial revolution and put in place these proper measures and, of course, uh, not only have the proper measures, but have the proper oversight, have the right sort of organizations and people in charge of going out and ensuring, oh, this building isn't just going to collapse on, you know, a few thousand people and kill them. Um, however this one has. And what's interesting about the Rana Plaza factory collapse is we can really see um, in the brands that this is not an isolated problem within fast fashion. We're going to talk about fast fashion a lot because fast fashion has gotten kind of a bad name um, for being one of the biggest abusers of um, uh, sort of both pollution and workers' rights. Um, because, of course, their garments are so cheap and they need to be made so quickly. Um, but I guess, in a way, fast fashion still is a bit of the culprit because it has moved the industry, even if a market isn't particularly categorized as fast fashion. It has moved the industry on a whole in a certain direction. So here we see, you know, um, typically not... Uh, uh, brands that would be associated with fast fashion, um, Prada, Gucci, Versace, um, being made, you know, you like to think, oh, Prada, Gucci, Versace, these are going to be made by, you know, artisans in, in, in Europe or something like this. No, it all gets made at the same sweatshop. Um, it's just marketed differently and designed differently, and potentially they use, um, you know, slightly better materials. But all gets made at the same sweatshop. Um, and so... It is not an isolated incident within the, um, again, fast fashion industry. And again, this sort of, um, you know, it's it stands out by how deadly it was. But again, it's not a, it wasn't a rare occurrence, let's say, in this time um, in especially Bangladesh to have this sort of either structural fa failure or fire. Um, it happened actually quite regularly. This one was just incredibly egregious and incredibly uh, deadly. I'd also like to put a little bit of a spotlight on Cambodian garment workers. Um, Cambodian garment workers have particularly been a population that has faced um, some pretty rampant exploitation. Uh, for many years, Cambodian garment workers have fought for a living wage. Um, I have kind of a happier update to this a little bit. Um, so there are few job opportunities in Cambodia, and the garment industry is one of the country's largest employers. Garment workers in Cambodia often have no other option for employment and are sometimes forced to work in the garment factories. Um, so when I say forced, a lot of uh, women here, they'll be picked up for infractions by the police, um, sometimes fabricated, sometimes real, sometimes serious, sometimes not, um, and they're given an option, um, go to prison or work in the garment factory. And because Cambodia is, again, another one of those developing nations trying to boost their economy through the garment industry, 
um, the police are pretty much given free reign to go and get employees. Um, so a lot of these women will sort of, again, get rounded up by the police for various causes and given the option prison or um, go work in the garment factories. Um, obviously they choose garment factories because Cambodian prisons are, are even worse than garment factories. Um, but you can't really say that they're there on their own free will to work. For many years, the wages were too low to survive on and the working conditions quite poor. After a long fight and international intervention, Cambodian garment workers now have won a $190 monthly minimum wage. Um, and so a lot of times when we look at what garment workers are making, um, the, their actual wages are seem ridiculously low to us as Americans. I mean, there's no way anybody could live uh, on $190 uh, in America, especially try to support children with that. Um, in Cambodia, it's a little bit more possible. In fact, they were fighting, they were fighting tooth and nail to get $160 uh, a month. And if you sort of look at a lot of the profits of these fashion companies, what they're making, I mean, it's, it's such a small drop in the bucket um, it just kind of makes your skin crawl sometimes. Uh, but they have won their $190, which was $30 more than they were originally asking for. Um, and since there has been a lot of international attention on um, their protests and on their plight, uh, they were sort of forced into, or the uh, garment own, factory owners were, were sort of forced and to giving them a monthly minimum wage uh, that was um, close to what they would like and that of course uh, reflects what they would need to be able to feed themselves, potentially uh, uh, feed a child as well, uh, so on and so forth. However, their conditions still remain poor even though they are making more money. Um, in 2017, mass fainting in factories occurred. Uh, very sort of strange, mysterious case, um, but if you look at their actual conditions, the mystery kind of dissipates. With more than 1,600 cases being reported in 2017 of, of fainting. In 2018, a single case of more than 200 people was reported. Uh, uh, they were reported fainting at a garment factory at a single time. Although no one cause has been identified, uh, it is presumed to be the cause of malnourishment. Again, they still make so little money that it's hard for them to feed themselves. Exhaustion, they still have to work long hours. Dehydration and excessive heat in the factories due to poor ventilation. So I said the factory conditions are still quite poor. It gets quite hot in Cambodia. They do not have air conditioning. They do not have proper ventilation. So you combine, you know, the, the heat, um, which would cause dehydration because, of course, they can't take breaks to drink water and things like that. Um, they probably don't also have a great source of fresh drinking water at the factory. Um, long hours and malnourishment put all those together and, you know, this sort of mysterious fainting case um, makes a little bit more sense. Um, another problem facing Cambodian garment workers is the dangerous way factories commute the workers to and from work. Um, so this is how the factories provide transportation. So a lot of garment workers don't have their own transportation. They don't have cars or anything like that. Um, so pretty much what they're do they do is they load up, uh, up into trucks like this, um, kind of like livestock. Um, they're overloaded and of course this is not a safe way to transport people. Um, and many of the garment workers uh, uh, are caused injury and even sometimes death due to this mode of transportation. Indian garment workers. So um, a recent report by Berkeley professor Siddharth Khan uh, provided a startling look at the conditions faced by the home garment workers in India. So these are workers that work out of their home and they're, um, they're pretty much, they would be considered uh, independent contractors um, in America. So they would work like on a 1099. That's if anything was regulated properly. However, regulations um, are, don't stretch to the home or, and the Indian government is um, apparently not uh, very well capable of um, 
implementing their own standards and their own laws when it comes to these home workers. Again, it's not in a factory. There's no factory to go to. And this is kind of, since it's behind closed doors, it's very difficult to regulate. Um, however, in this report, uh, it revealed vast numbers of workers being exploited and large percentage of these workers being forced into labor under Indian law standards. Um, so, of course, India has a lot of standards um, for work and everything like this. However, these cases, um, again, since they are sort of, you know, sub-subcontract uh, scenarios um, and, you know, these independent workers um, in houses, it's very difficult to regulate. Um, and in that lack of regulation, we see many of these workers, again, being young girls, being exploited. Much of the work being done by these laborers is uh, finishing work, being subcontracted out by larger garment factories. Uh, the work can include embroidery, tasseling, button application, and beadwork. So this would be an instance where a garment factory in India may be a perfectly fine, uh, treats their garment workers great, but they don't necessarily do button application. So to save a little bit of money, they're going to send it out to one of these girls who, um, judging by the percentages, is most likely being forced to work um, in a sort of slave labor situation um, to get money for whomever, you know, is owning them or um, forcing them to work. Um, it could be, you know, scarily enough, it can even be parents, but um, it could be other people as well. Um, and a lot of times it's either for, for no, no money um, or they get a very little return from uh, what the garments are, garment factories are actually looking to pay them. So worker exploitation is common in the fashion industry. Um, I've highlighted uh, just a few sort of areas of egregious abuse uh, that have been in the news somewhat recently, um, but it is not isolated to any of these countries. It's not isolated to any of those brands. It's fairly widespread. Um, and that's just sort of the fact of the matter. Um, and just to sort of illustrate that point, I have a few other sort of reports um, and news stories about garment worker abuse. So in 2016, even after a history of criticism of Nike's use of sweatshops, uh, the WRC and the, uh, the workers' rights, um, I should have written down the, these acronyms, um, um, Google them. Um, issued reports of labor standard violations in Vietnamese garment factories used to create Nike products. Uh, I believe the Workers' Rights Coalition and the Fair Labor Association, I believe, um, for WRC and FLA. Um, in 2018, a report published by uh, Global Labor Justice, H&M um, and Gap were highlighted for daily abuses toward their garment workers. Uh, over 540 workers alleged abuses between January and May of that year, which included rape, physical abuse, gendered bullying, and the misuse of power. The report also included examples of forced overtime and the prevention of bathroom breaks. In 2011, Zara was accused of producing clothing in factories with slave labor, like conditions in Brazil. In 2017, Zara shoppers in Istanbul found notes in their purchased clothing from the garment manufacturers. Uh, the hidden notes read, I made this item you are going to buy, but I didn't get paid for it. In 2020, The Guardian published an article describing the conditions of Jordanian garment workers. They alleged forced labor, sex sexual assault, wage theft, and forcing workers to work sometimes for 24 to 48 hours straight. The brands associated with the Jordanian garment factory scandal included Victoria's Secret, Kohl's, JCPenney, Nike, Gap, and Hanes. They have all used Jordanian garment factories to produce their uh, product. In uh, 2020, the Strate Australian Strategic Policy Institute published a report that claimed 27 factories in China were using forced slave labor by upwards of 80,000 Uyghurs. Uh, Uyghurs, again, are the Muslim population in Western China. 
where China has uh, recently been under fire for very fierce criticism of their treatment. Um, uh, the Chinese are accused of ethnically cleansing the Uyghurs um, uh, by putting them into concentration camps uh, and also forced labor camps. Uh, brands using these factories to produce, again, the 27 factories in China that were using forced slave labor by the Uyghurs, uh, these brands using these factories uh, included in Abercrombie & Fitch, Adidas, Gap, H&M, Inditex, um, which is the parent company of Zara, Nike, North Face, Puma, Fila, Uniqlo, and Espirit. Now that we've covered, uh, just sort of scratch the first uh, surface of worker exploitation, let's get into um, environmental costs. Um, the dirty side of fashion. So fashion pollutes many different ways, and the fashion industry is a major contributor to global pollution. It has a markedly bad impact because of how widespread the pollution is. The fashion industry is responsible for water, air, and soil pollution. And fashion is considered the second dirtiest of industries, second only to the oil and gas industries. So pretty bad. There's a lot of cleaning up that needs to be done within the practices of the fashion industry. Let's start with air pollution. Probably one of the smaller areas, but uh, significant enough to talk about. Fashion production makes up a full 10% of global carbon emissions. Um, so that's pretty huge. Um, it's a huge chunk of the full uh, world's carbon emissions. And a lot of this, um, <laughs> it's gonna seem really stupid, uh, but some of this is simply the burning of unsold clothes. In 2017, Burberry incinerated almost $38 million worth of unsold clothes clothing. Um, to be fair, this was a huge story back then. Um, they got a lot of slack for it, and the brand has since made a commitment saying that they are going to no longer incinerate their clothes. So why is this bad? Well, burning is bad because it um, produces a lot of carbon emission with the smoke, um, and again, it's, it's needless burning. Um, and you might be asking, well, why do these companies burn their clothes? Well, um, think about supply and demand. So um, if you have a lot of unsold goods and you sell them all off and they, you know, sort of flood the market, your product is going to become cheap. You have to limit your product and its product availability um, or else it will simply reduce the value of the good. So um, a lot of companies, a lot of companies, um, instead of donating um, or properly recycling their product, they'll just destroy it. Um, and again, that is to keep the value of their product strong. Um, if a company was simply, let's say, to throw away a lot of their goods, um, well, people can easily, you know, you can dumpster dive for it, or they can go and they can, and then they have it. So um, they don't want the market to flood uh, with all these sort of free goods um, simply because they made too much product. Um, so again, there's a lot of different solutions to this. You can still destroy it, but you don't have to burn it. So um, H and M, uh, they will shred their clothes. Um, instead of uh, burning them, which at least is has less carbon emission and is still far from being an acceptable solution. Um, or they can manage their product creation better. They can come up with better estimates and not produce so much goods. Um, and then they will not have this problem. Um, so again, there's a lot of solutions to this problem. And again, when I say, uh, you know, I, I can't say that Burberry doesn't do this anymore. They've said that they don't do it, but time and time again, we've seen that, you know, a lot of um, standards uh, that the fashion industry sort of says they adhere to, again, there's no regulation. There's no law saying you can't do this. There's no regulatory body um, that's independent, that's coming in saying, oh, this is what you're doing and this is not what you're doing. 
Um, all of these are, you know, are just quote unquote commitments. Um, and of course, because brands need to have a good PR, they need to have a good face to the public, they can say, oh, we're going to be green and we're not going to burn clothes and we're not going to do this. But at the end of the day, so long as they don't get caught, um, it's, it's all the same. They can still do everything that they were doing. Um, and you see this time and time again. Um, it's, oh, we didn't know this horrible factory was going to collapse. We have a new commitment to workers' rights, and here's our wonderful statement, and it's filled with flowery, flowery language about how much the company cares about their workers and human rights. Um, and then a few years later, it, there's another scandal that comes out, and they try to sweep it out, and of course we're going to make good, and of course we're going to do better. Um, but again, without that, without laws, and without an independent regulatory body, um, it seems that change is uh, a very hard, if not impossible, to make. Now let's talk about water consumption and the tragedy of the Aral Sea. So growing cotton, processing fabrics, and creating synthetic fabrics all consumes a great deal of fresh water. Cotton especially is known as a thirsty crop, requiring 8,000 to 10,000 liters of water to produce roughly a kilo of cotton. Um, that would be about a pair of jeans. And this is just the average um, consumption of water. A lot of times in very dry climates, um, it can skyrocket to almost double that amount of water. And a case study in cotton and its water consumption can be seen in the Aral Sea. The Aral Sea was once the fourth largest lake in the world. But after decades of aggressive and poorly managed irrigation of its tributary rivers, the water, um, uh, and basically those irrigation um, canals that were built, were mainly there to water cotton crops. Um, uh, and after years of that, in decades, it has almost dried up. So here is a satellite image um, taken in the, in the mid 80s of the um, Aral Sea. And again, fourth largest lake in the world. That's huge, it's absolutely vast. Um, a number of different irrigation canals uh, were built to try to boost the agricultural sector, section of this area, um, as specifically in Uzbekistan, um, and specifically to grow cotton. Other crops, of course, were grown, but cotton, or the quote-unquote white gold, was the main driver of this pro uh, project. Um, the canals were leaking, were poorly built, and the um, land was poorly managed. It was over farmed um, to try to gain a lot of profit in a short amount of time. Um, so basically the water use, the land use was all mismanaged. Um, and after a few decades, this is the Aral Sea, or what was the Aral Sea. This was taken in 2009. Um, what was once the fourth largest lake in the world has almost dried up, um, absolutely devastating an entire ecosystem, um, turning a sea into a desert, uh, ruining the lives of countless other workers. So um, the Aral Sea in itself um, had other industries like fishing, tourism, all these different things. Um, but it is all now a desert. Um, through recent damming and management programs a little bit has started to fill in. So if you look at recent, there's a little bit that has started to fill in here. Although um, what has happened is, is could probably be deemed irreversible, at least in our lifetimes, um, and is known as one of the greatest ecological disasters um, of the modern age. Um, so yeah. Uh, water is also used in treating fibers and textiles. It is used in, to dye, pre-shrink, and apply different finishes like mercerization and bleaching. So we see water being used in a lot of different areas, um, not just for growing our crops. And we see this, um, you know, water consumption, especially for cotton and processing fabrics, all over the world. It's it's really a race for fresh water, and it's, it's only going to become a more difficult problem for a couple reasons. If we don't curb 
um, fast fashion practices. Um, so I will sort of point a finger at fast fashion because fast fashion, it, the model is really to pr produce a lot and produce it quickly. Um, it's it sort of puts the manufacturing industry um, on overdrive. And to produce all this fabric, you need more cotton. To get more cotton, you need to over farm. Um, and when you're starting to compete now with global warming and, and a reduced supply of fresh water in the world, um, you're going to start fighting. Um, are people going to have enough to drink or does it go to cotton? Or are we going to have it for other industries? Are we going to have it, you know, um, for the ecosystem? Um, so with fresh water getting rarer and rarer as a resource, um, this is an issue that is going to really be highlighted, I feel, in the next few years. Um, especially, again, because even if we get off um, cotton, uh, there's still a lot of water that goes into the processing of fabrics and also creating synthetic fabrics. So that was just water consumption. Now let's talk about water pollution. So both the creation of synthetic fibers and the processing of fabrics use a lot of water, but also chemicals. Um, many times toxic chemicals are used. So what will happen is a lot of times we will wash. Uh, if we have to dye a fabric, it'll go into a vat. That vat is filled with water and the water is also filled with dye and chemicals to help the dye adhesion. Um, and then we will also treat um, fabrics with a lot of different chemicals. Again, it goes into a water bath and the water bath um, helps to sort of apply the chemicals um, uh, by, you know, put it, in, it instead of just sort of spraying it on, we put it in this vat and the vat is sort of saturated with these chemicals and with the water. Um, after they're done, there are many ways that you can properly manage this wastewater. Um, however, textile mills don't always properly manage their wastewaters and they can dump harmful pollution into rivers. And this can negatively affect people's health and is harmful to the environment. Um, so this picture is from the Jakarta Post um, in Indonesia. And um, it is the place where the Chitterum River route, uh, runs. And the Chitterum River is now known as one of the most polluted rivers on Earth. Um, this is not the Chitterum River. It's a tributary of it. And what the Jakarta Post is claiming here is that this is untreated industrial wastewater running from off from a textile mill. You can see it's all frothy, fromy, and it's dark from the dye um, uh, it's been using to dye clothing and, and process them um, right into this tributary river, again, being completely untreated. Um, pretty awful. Um, and we're going to get to also soil pollution, so I'd like you to notice what's right next to this untreated industrial wastewater runoff. What do that look like over here? Little farms? That's exactly what they are. Okay. Um, so again, let's talk about the Chitterum River. Um, obviously not the only place that this is happening. Um, again, I just want to highlight some of the more egregious, um, exaggerated examples of what I'm talking about. And this this happens a lot. Um, but here in, in Indonesia, um, one of the large sources of the pollution to the Chitterum River is the textile mills that line its and its tributaries banks. These mills have been blamed for the presence of lead, mercury, arsenic, as well as other toxins in the water of the Chitterum. And this has created a lot of problems. There's a lot of documentaries about the Chitterum River if you want to go. Um, and uh, learn a little bit more about it. In fact, um, I'll provide additional links um, underneath this video if you want to learn about some of the other, uh, a little bit more about some of the things that I've covered in this video. Um, and, you know, this has just had a devastating effects on environment, on, on people's health, um, and it's taken away what was a sort of a, a free resource of the land. Um, it's killed the uh, fishermen's livelihood. Um, people are finding it harder and harder to find uh, clean drinking water um, where they used to just have this nice beautiful river. Um, again, it's, it's been taken away from them. Now let's also talk about plastics pollution. 
So synthetic fibers like polyester, nylon, spandex, etc. are a form of plastic and so carry the same environmental concerns as plastics. And um, synthetics now, uh, there's different estimates, um, but one estimate is it comprises um, almost half of the fibers in uh, garments today, uh, used in garments today. So a huge percentage of clothing today are now using synthetic fibers. Um, they're cheaper to make. A lot of times they have properties that are really great for us. Nylon's really strong. It's really easy to care for. Spandex, of course, makes things stretchy. Um, so they have all these sort of beneficial qualities into our clothes. Um, but again, they are plastic. Um, in 2019, a report in the Fordham Environmental Law Review claimed that textiles account for over 6% of municipal, municipal solid waste in the U.S. That's a huge percentage. So basically, all uh, out of all of the solid waste in uh, the U.S., 6% of it was textiles. Synthetic fabrics are also a primary contributor to the presence of microplastics in the oceans and other water supplies. So you may have heard about the issue of microplastics. And basically, so um, we think of plastic, it's here forever, but it does break down in the sense that it breaks down into smaller pieces. Now those pieces don't biodegrade like other sort of organic uh, materials where they sort of get reabsorbed and re reused by the environment. But what plastics do is they break down and they release chemicals um, and also they just sort of stick around but in smaller pieces. And what's bad about that is it becomes sort of this ingrained part of the environment so it gets ingested by animals, it becomes sand on the beach, um, and we don't really know how this is going to affect environments um, long term, um, but we can only theorize that this huge influx of a new sort of chemical material within um, environments is going to have an impact. Um, and again, microplastics are those small pieces of plastics that are created when plastics break down. Uh, the image, of course, is of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch over here, um, obviously not solely created by fashion or by uh, synthetic fabrics, but of course they are a large contributor to it. So the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is a giant um, patch of plastic waste uh, that because of the or uh, ocean currents have sort of congregated, let's say, uh, about in the middle of the uh, northern Pacific. Um, and a lot of, you know, it's, it's sort of been a, um, a warning about plastic infusions within the environment um, because it is rather large um, currently. Um, again, you can Google more if you want to get depressed. Um, soil pollution. Soil pollution is when the presence of toxic chemicals is high enough to be of risk to humans and other wildlife. Uh, that would be in the soil. Um, and this, of course, is very um, dangerous because it can either prohibit the growth of plants, so it can ruin the ability for, um, um, you know, people who want to grow things to eat, um, or if things do grow, um, what's in the soil gets absorbed by the plants, so then those plants then are toxic themselves. Um, and when textile mills don't properly manage their wastewater, it isn't what just water that can get impacted. The soil will absorb the wastewater and also the toxic elements. Uh, this can be particularly bad if food is grown into the soil. Again, a lot of times, um, remember I've sort of uh, pointed out those little farms um, next to those. Well, the soil's right next to them. Any sort of leaching um, out of that water into the soil um, is going to go ahead and go into those plants. Um, because again, um, plants can absorb different chemicals and elements through the soil into their uh, own leaves and, and fruits and grains and things like that. In addition, over-aggressive uh, farming practices used to grow uh, cotton have also been known to cause soil pollution. And these can have uh, uh, negative impacts on the environment. So um, again, when you use ba bad farming practices, it can be very bad for the soil. 
as well as for the surrounding environment. And this can include neglecting crop rotation and the overuse of pesticides and fertilizers. Um, so just briefly, crop rotation is um, changing up either the crop that you grow or leaving a field fallow for a little while. So basically giving the soil a quote unquote rest in a way to replenish its nutrients. Um, and farmers will do this again by either swapping crops in and out or just leaving a, uh, a field fallow or to rest and not doing anything with it. Um, and that gives the soil time to sort of replenish its minerals um, and its sort of natural state. Um, and this is really important to do because if you overwork the uh, soil and neglect crop rotation, uh, you can basically produce a desert. And that is basically what caused the um, Dust Bowl in the 30s, uh, where the South uh, over uh, farmed, they didn't use crop rotation, and they turned all this beautiful arable land into pretty much a Dust Bowl. Um, also, the overuse of pesticides and fertilizers are not good. They leach into the soil, um, and they can have very negative impacts uh, to the land surrounding them, um, as well as to the soil. And here is this image, um, and we can see this this river is is clearly not clean water. It hasn't been edited in Photoshop or anything. That's just the color that is happening right now, um, and that's probably dye runoff from a factory. Um, a bit of a dark joke that uh, I've heard sort of bandied about the fashion industry. Um, again, dark humor, but you can always the joke is. You can always tell what the hot color for the season is going to be uh, because it's the color that the rivers in China run. Um, basically, again, the the joke is there's there's so much pollution um, from the textile mills um, in in China and in other places uh, that it influences the color of the rivers and how they run. Um, again, not a very funny joke, but um, just used to illustrate my point that these sorts of practices are very, very widespread within the fashion industry. So now that you're thoroughly bummed out, what now? Uh, how to be fashion conscious? What do we do? How do we tackle these? Well, I don't really have an answer on everything because they're fairly big, um, elaborate problems, but I can speak to some things. There are people trying to help. With the growing information about the negative impacts of the modern day fashion industry, there has been an increasing demand from customers for the use of better practices. A number of new models in the fashion industry have arisen to counter the fast fashion model. They include sustainable fashion, which tries to address the environmental impacts of the fashion industry, and ethical fashion, which tries to address the labor issues that the fashion industry struggles with. Now, a lot of times these uh, phrases are also used interchangeably. Um, sustainable, again, uh, the keyword sustainable is typically used in an environmental context. Uh, so we can use, usually use it there. But again, um, sustainable, a lot of people use the term sustainable fashion to also mean um, fair workers' rights, um, you know, implementing safety and labor standards. Um, as well as environmental standards and also vice versa. Ethical fashion can also include um, elements of making the fashion industry uh, less polluting and a little bit more green. So again, many groups are forming to aid uh, in the demanding of basic human rights for fashion industry workers. Uh, people are pressured by uh, people are pressuring their elected officials to pass laws to protect even the rights of workers overseas. So we can do this by putting um, import laws into place. And again, it can be rather difficult to always guarantee uh, that your products. If I'm say I own just like a little boutique, or I'm a designer that needs their garments to be done, um, it's always it's difficult for me to always know that my garments are being made. 100% uh, with good labor practices um, for the reasons I discussed before. Things can be hidden under, you know, subcontractors, sub subcontractors, independent contractors. Um, and again, you know, people make these places where there are specifically 
egregious worker violations. They don't try to, you know, um, advertise it. They'll advertise a price, perhaps, um, but they don't necessarily, obviously, they don't uh, necessarily advertise the fact that, uh, oh, yes, we have horrible working conditions. Come buy, you know, our garments. Um, that doesn't happen. Of course, they try to sweep that under the rug, keep it in the back room uh, as much as they can. Um, but again, with laws and uh, uh, with not just in America, but overseas as well, um, those in tandem can act as a defense against that and protect not only the garment workers themselves, but also the designer who does care about using um, uh, you know, fair labor standards, um, buying from garment factories that treat their workers fairly, allow them to work in safe conditions, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so baby steps in two th uh, 2020, President Obama banned the import of goods created by child slaves. Um, <laughs> you might be kind of dropping your jaw. Wow, that was legal until 2012. Yeah, like I said, it's really hard for America to impose labor standards on other countries. Um, again, we can do things like ban the imports of goods created by child slaves. No, normal slaves is still illegal, but child slaves, okay. Um, now this was mainly, this act was mainly targeted at um, Thai, the Thai seafood industry, but again, um, obviously it doesn't specify to any one industry, so it does give some protections uh, to very young uh, girls that might be forced to work uh, in the garment industry. And customers themselves are also pressuring fashion brands to make stronger commitments um, to the use of ethical labor practices. Um, over here, I have an institute called the Ethical Fashion Initiative. You can go visit their site if you want. Um, but they are committed to connecting designers to ethically created um, uh, garments. So um, they're pretty much a liaison. We're gonna go, we're gonna do you know, the footwork to ensure that you know, this garment factory or you know, that garment factory is using fair practices, the workers are happy, they're getting paid a living wage, they work in safe conditions, um, and we're gonna connect you with those people and or garment factories um, that you can use as a designer to create your goods. Sustainable fashion. So consumers have uh, a higher attention to the environmental impacts of their clothing and are looking for a change. Just all in all, people are looking uh, for changes in their lifestyle to adhere to a more sort of sustainable um, or environmentally friendly outlook. Um, beware though, uh, there are a lot of brands that are simply using this as a, a happy face, let's say, um, as a marketing tool with no real concrete commitment to environmental um, issues. Uh, it's very easy to slap a green leaf and say, oh, we're so green. Uh, there's no laid out requirement. So by law, there's not like you have to, um, you know, fulfill X, Y, and Z before you can call yourself green. Um, I can, you know, I can go dump a barrel of oil in the ocean and say, look how green I am. That's not against the law. Um, so again, what I do worry a lot about the sort of environmental movement is a lot of what we'll see happened um, in the food industry. So the organic labeling of foods became very, very popular. And it, USDA Organic, that stamp, has a certain number of requirements tied to it to be able to get that label. However, anyone can say they're just organic. I mean, organic is, is pretty much anything. Um, so that label was misused as marketing a lot. It didn't really mean anything. Um, and when these labels don't really mean anything, you don't have to satisfy X, Y, and Z um, to be able to get that label, um, and companies can use it willy-nilly. Um, they can use it simply to signal something to the customer that they want um, without ever really having to do anything, without it making any commitments to making their product cleaner, so on and so forth. Um, 
However, having said that, many brands and organizations are start, uh, starting up that want to reduce the negative impacts of the fashion in, uh, environment. So there's more watchdogs, um, and there are brands that partner uh, with certain institutions that will get a sort of accreditation for how they do business, how they make their product. Um, they ensure that it is clean for the environment. So um, be careful if this is something that you care about as a consumer. Um, don't take a tag or a label or simply what a company says about themselves at face value. Um, I've seen a lot of companies out there that I have huge doubts. H&M, looking at you. Um, oh, we're green now. We're a green company. We're sustainable. Yeah, bull. Um, that is pure marketing. Um, if there have been no no verified uh, you know, claims, how are they green? Uh, they just are saying it. Uh, but again, there are ways to check. There are watchdogs out there on the fashion industry that will say this company uh, is dirty, this company, uh, we've checked it out, uh, we've checked out their supply line. Um, they are making you know, real efforts to reduce the amount of pollution. Uh, we know that they are making sure that their cotton um, is, is grown with good agricultural um, practices. Uh, that their you know uh, dyeing facilities they want a, a mill that is is going to treat their wastewater properly uh, and you know they're going to uh, potentially even uh, pay their workers a living wage uh, from their garment factory so if they haven't been um, sort of verified by any sort of third party I would be very highly skeptical of claims but a lot of brands see again at the end of the day, there's still a push to do this because consumers are wanting it more and more. And if consumers want it, brands will be pressured to follow suit. Um, in addition, a push for quote-unquote slow fashion is emerging, uh, which aims to slow the rapid influx over, uh, the, of overproduction in the fashion industry. So this is sort of the counter-argument to fast fashion. Um, and again, the overproduction of clothing um, exacerbates all of these existing uh, uh, problems. So in the fashion, again, fast fashion, it's all about making a lot of things very quickly. Um, and you know, if you have, if you, if just think about it. So if you have all these problems along the way, um, problems with with polluting the water when we're making our textiles and processing them, um, processes with pollution processes with you know uh, overworking garment workers um, what's going to make everything worse is simply to ask that industry to just times everything by 10 um, which is pretty much what the fast fashion model has asked the industry to do um, you know we used to have maybe four seasons traditionally um, a summer a uh, spring, uh, fall, and then winter resort. Now fast fashion companies are coming out, you know, collection every month, collection every couple weeks. Um, and this has basically pushed production into overdrive. Uh, more textiles need to be produced. More garments need to be processed and made. Uh, more fabrics need to be dyed. So we're doing all of these different things um, and, and, and really in just an exploded vo volume. Um, and not only, again, so if you have, you know, a, take a textile mill that's dumping their wastewater, now they're just dip, dumping 10 times more wastewater, um, but they're also encouraged to take these uh, shortcuts, to cut these corners, um, because of course, you know, doing things like properly managing wastewater or giving workers breaks or everything, it slows down that machine. Um, and when the machine is, at, is, is asked to do so much, to produce so much, uh, there's no leeway, there's no ability for it to slow down, stop, make sure, you know, workers are okay, make sure safety issues have been addressed, make sure that, you know, wastewater is being treated properly, make sure that we can leave a field fallow uh, so the soil doesn't get destroyed. Um, no, 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 we need more, more, more. Um, so again, if this push towards slow fashion is, hey guys, let's stop making garbage clothing that only lasts a year and start making clothing that will last for years 
um, then you know hopefully the consumer if we can say and, and, and inform the consumer about how devastating this model is um, we know you're getting your dopamine hit every time you buy that shirt and you want to do it week after week after week but hey it's killing the environment let's make clothing that is you know quality made uh, made okay made in a way that you can you know doesn't make your skin crawl uh, when you put it on so to speak um, and then since it isn't a piece of trash it's gonna last you for like 10 years and that way we can sort of bring the pressure off of the industry a little bit allow for certain measures to be put into place that wouldn't be detrimental to their model right now um, and you know reduce waste because uh, again with all this production of clothing so much of it just gets thrown away or burned or destroyed or whatever else because of overproduction um, you know which also has its its other unintended consequences that I haven't even gotten into um, there's there's so much I really haven't even gotten into again this is really just skimming the surface um, but again so this idea of slow fashion is emerging um, and it's becoming popular I, I'm hoping it will become more popular across the board um, and in a lot of ways so we like that fast fashion has made style and clothing cheap um, but in a way if you think about it um, again you get to the fun aspect of going and, and shopping a lot that of course but if I buy, you know, let's say a, a, a shirt for $20 at H&M, it's only going to last like a year, let's face it, especially if I wear it. Um, so I'm going to wear, you know, uh, buy another one, another $20, another $20, another $20. Um, but what is actually going to cost less for me? Um, if I buy, you know, a $20 shirt every six months, um, but I buy one shirt for $100 that's going to last me five years, it's actually cheaper to do the latter. I'm spending less money on that one shirt. Of course, I don't get that, that fun shopping experience every few weeks. Um, but maybe we can replace that with something else to keep us engaged. Um, because, again, it's, it's really not good for the environment, for workers. It's really not good for us um, to get our happiness so solely through repetition of material acquisition. Uh, I just don't think it's good for our souls. But that's just my opinion. Anyways, um, this, this is supposed to be the hopeful section. <laughs> Anyways, for additional information on the topics discussed, uh, please see the links below in Blackboard, and I'm going to try to provide as many links to, um, you know, news stories and documentaries about the topics covered in this video. Um, do check it out, um, and again, you can do your own research. There is certainly no shortage of information about crappy stuff going on in the fashion industry, and again, this is really just two areas. I, there's a lot of other areas that we can go over that are eth ethically problematic within the fashion industry. But again, um, I wanted to focus on these um, as, in my opinion, being two of the most um, sort of prominent and uh, widespread uh, issues ethically within the fashion industry. All right, guys. So hopefully now you can, um, you know, look at your garment, look at your shopping, look at your own designs um, uh, with maybe a different lens. Um, and again, this is not meant to persuade you to not like fashion anymore. Fashion is still great. It's still amazing. Um, and it's not like it's going to go away anyways, because it's not like one day we're all just going to wake up and not wear clothing. Um, but hopefully it will sort of, again, give you that new lens to look at things a little bit differently. Um, maybe look at your own closet, your own shopping habits. Um, and, you know, think about ways that you can alter it to maybe make it a little bit more ethical. Um, and as a designer, what is this something that you now are going to, you know, bring into your designs, uh, make it a point um, to make clothing that is ethical, um, that doesn't harm the environment, that doesn't harm workers' rights. Um, because we certainly do need more people going into the fashion industry with that view. Um, so, uh, again, um, don't be turned off, 
Uh, but again, it is important to be aware of these issues um, and their impacts on uh, the world. Um, so again, check out the links and um, you know have a bit of reflection time on your own designs and closet. All right, guys. See you later. Bye bye.